Derek? I need fuel. Go ahead, quick, get the car. Welcome back. It's been a while, but we're back together again. Consider this a test to weed out all the Fairweather listeners. If you're still here, congratulations, you passed the trial. There'll be cake served at the end of this podcast for all. Uh, Joke aside, I've been keeping busy, as I'm sure you all have in your own subjectively protagonistic worlds. Uh, Everyone in my family and circle, as far as I know, is doing pretty well. Uh, Certainly nothing to report or complain about. I trust and hope that wherever you're listening to this right now, you are well. Well enough anyway to take a little time to sit for a few moments with me while I tell you a couple of stories that I found interesting. Maybe join me for a puff. Maybe don't. Both states of being are fully compatible with the vibe here on Baked and Awake. First up today, I want to more or less introduce a topic. Uh, We're not going to go ultra deep into this, but I really want to tell you about it. I was only ever dimly aware of this technology. It seems to me semi lost to history, or at least just like really out of favor, you know, probably for plenty of reasons, uh, many of them good, and we'll talk about it. But uh, not, you know, it's, it's semi lost to history, but not really from the very distant past, as I see it. Uh, This technology is like something out of a steampunk novel or a fantasy film, or so I kind of thought. Maybe we've seen it in novelty applications or extremely low efficiency applications in like parade vehicles or old weird agricultural vehicles and and fairs and, and shows, things like this. This is what I thought, that it was just not a practical technology and that it wasn't even a thing, really. As I said, I almost thought it, you know, never existed in a very high or sophisticated form. But what I'm talking about, what I'm trying to introduce is is a technology that I just learned about on YouTube. Where else? Okay, love it or hate it, YouTube for me has the most content anywhere. You know, don't at me on that. That's just where we get a lot of this stuff that we talk about here. Uh, It's called transport gasifier technology, though, to get to it. Transport gasifiers. In short, right, cars, trucks, you name it. Trains, boats, slash giant vessels, ships, uh, running on biomass fuels, wood-powered vehicles coal, right? We know big old boats used to be coal fired back in the day. Uh, And I don't think all of them were gasifiers. I think a lot of them were traditional like kind of combustion chambers uh, that would boil water and create steam power for for vessels. Um, And maybe that was deemed safer in some regards. Um, But I think This gasifier technology differs in some subtle ways from what we saw a lot with coal-fired steam locomotives and stuff like that, at least in the old West days, like the, you know, the black smoke chugging from the, uh, from the smokestack of the, uh, some of the trains back in the, in the early days. Uh, I I think that all runs cleaner when they're, you know, up and hot and, and a lot of that black smoke goes away. You see that, you know, maybe leaving the station a lot. Um, but, uh, I'm sure plenty of them, you know, chooched quite a bit of nasty stuff out into the, uh, sky. 
But these gasifiers, quite a bit cleaner. They don't really spew a lot of gross stuff, particulate, etc., out into the air. They they had filtration systems on these uh, systems, and they had them at many different scales, evidently all the way down to, and I recently found finally like a cool treasure trove of a post on the internet about this in a, uh, like a European antique vintage motorbike forum of some kind where somebody posted about gasifier powered motorbikes, mopeds, like tiny motorcycles that were, were gasifiered. Uh, you know, t- in, in some cases, I want to say these systems could be used alongside a gasoline fueling system. You might even be able to switch back and forth uh, depending on the level of work was put into the, the system. But many of these systems were built by like Volvo, Mercedes-Benz, uh, you know, all the manufacturers uh, where apparently it reached its height was during World War II. Uh, according to this video I watched, the video was entitled 100 Years of Wood-Powered Vehicles. It's right about an hour in length. It's like the perfect length. Um, more than enough to get you interested in the topic if you're like a anything of a gearhead or anything of an off-gridder. Um, you know, a prepper. Got that, you know, survivalist mindset where you just love to know about how people did get by in, in harder times. During World War II, evidently, because of the liquid gas and oil shortages and restrictions and literal hard shortages to the various armies 75% of everything rolling or up to that number something like that was gasifier powered Uh, they trained with gasifier powered tanks through the you know through the war to save fuel Um, You know, they powered the tanks at the front with gas and oil because the gasifiers had their own risks. They, 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 as the name implies, you burn your biomass. It might be wood. It might be charcoal. It might be hard coal. It might be any mixture of these things, things found in the local environment. And uh, that biomass is burned in a low oxygen environment. It's intentionally kind of deprived of oxygen. This creates a reaction that creates a couple of gas compounds, including methane and a couple others that are highly combustible. They become what's known as a syngas uh, or wood gas. And that gas burns a lot cleaner than, you know, the, the red fire that you'll see from a wood fire. It, it's a, like a white fire, an almost invisible fire in the daylight if you're to light the exhaust uh, pipe of, of one of these uh, systems. Really cool stuff. You can run, a, you know, a V8 motor on this and drive down the road. I understand there's some, you know, um, power losses to be uh, dealt with. The the caloric value of wood gas is a little lower than modern gasoline. So you lose a few horsepower. Uh, I want to say it's not, you know, it's not insignificant. It's you might lose 20%, 30% off the top of a motor's rated power. But they're still quite efficient in the grand scheme of things, especially when you take into account the versatility of fuels that can be fed into a given motor. Um, crafty individuals have uh, built these on their off-grid farms and ranches, I want to say, for decades now. Uh, as YouTube is wont to do, you watch that first video on wood-powered vehicles which is chock full of great stock imagery and archival footage of these vehicles being used and being ran. Uh, Again, made by every manufacturer in the world. This technology does still exist. It's not gone. It's used in quote-unquote developing countries in varying forms to this day. 
uh, I want to say Korea and uh, parts of China used gasifier powered buses, you know, for civilian transport up until the 1990s, late 90s, early 2000s in some places. So, uh, and again, I want to say Eastern Europe may still have a couple of, you know, holdout uh, vehicles in service here and there that might be remnants of an old infrastructure system used in places where little else, you know, is available or used as a backup to a traditionally fueled fleet of vehicles. Uh, but these were the buses for a long time. These were uh, your car and your, uh, you know, farm truck, your ranch truck would be, you know, during all of the 1930s um, and into the 1940s. And for many people, I'm sure, who had converted their vehicles during that era for many years afterwards. I thought it was fantastic. So, yeah, so so YouTube, of course, will begin to serve you up these you know, more modern day off grid types who are out here building gasifier pickup trucks and using them around rural areas of the United States and other parts of the world. I find it utterly fascinating. I think it's, you know, not really a hidden technology. I think it's, you know, quote unquote, semi lost as I characterized it because, well, you're, you're literally a steampunk goof loading wood into a barbecue that you've got packed in the back of your vehicle that then creates a bunch of hot gas that you run it off of. Um, and again, there is, you know, there is the possibility if you had a leak or something, you could have some issues with that system um, in terms of maybe a risk of fire that's different or greater than a, a gasoline car. But how much different or greater? I mean, we know cars blow up too, right? <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, I got a uh, number of links for you guys to, to check out about gasification uh ones from like howstuffworks.com uh it's science.howstuffworks.com i don't know if that differs from and who's how stuff works i don't know I, I liked the article i read it it's pretty dry talks about the theory behind gasification in general um i i linked to the um forum post that i found it's called driveonwood.com cool little Forum. Let me make sure my link is good for you. It looks like it works. And the thread was called Motorcycles with Gasifiers. Um, bunch of cool pics in this thread, uh, like of old magazines just spread open and, and like crudely taken by guys. It's great. I absolutely love it. Um, and the pictures in the magazines are, are you know, so-so at best. Uh, there are some cool machines in this little thread here. And the gasifiers on some of these, some of these are absolute bicycles, guys. I love it. Um, are very streamlined, are very compact. And probably if you could tailor the size of your, you know, fuel storage there, whatever we call that, the substitute for a gas tank, if you could scale that properly to your, to your, daily needs where you had a couple destinations that you could make it to in one shot where you only had to reload on either end. I could see it being a compelling, fun, interesting, you know, way to get around and especially in circumstances when you couldn't continue to get good quality modern gas. Couldn't pay for it or couldn't procure it, period, because of shortages or bans outright. Um, and of course, we're all about electric bikes these days and, and fun stuff like that. Don't get me wrong. I absolutely love the quiet of electric bikes, electric scooters, uh, you know, electric unicycles, whatever you want to ride and get around on. Um, you know, I haven't tried them all yet, but I, I'm, I love it. Absolutely love it. Uh, electric cars, I think, are, you know, interesting. Uh, they've got, you know, it's a, obviously a challenging topic, right? Those things are environmentally kind of rough 
on the world in their own way and, and on several different levels from extraction to you know ultimate recyclability on down the line that's true of electric bikes and stuff too they're not they're not free of that uh, they're sexy though right they're much sexier than some you know chitty chitty bang bang uh, <laughs> model a going down the road or old ford courier smelling like a fireplace chugging down the road uh but man these things are interesting go look go check it out and tell me if you don't find it interesting as well uh i think i think this gasifier technology is is something that as i said it's still out there companies have done nothing but try to continue to refine them make them more efficient make them burn ever cleaner uh, in particular, it looks like, again, Eastern Europe, Russia seem to be strongholds of this. You're going to find some YouTube channels that might even be in Russian language, but um, have English subtitles. Maybe it's through the auto-generated subtitles. I don't know for sure. Uh, but there's there's a, a, quite a few proponents of the tech out there, I guess, is where I was going with that. Uh, you know, and we'll wind it down on gasifiers for today, but... You know, supporters say, hey, amazing off grid, be independent. It's sustainable. It's, you know, more efficient than you think. It's more powerful than you would expect. And this is something that you can implement in a number of different applications. You can use them in stationary applications and generate power from them, or you can use them in a transport application and power an internal combustion engine from them. Uh, the detractors, of course, are like, what the hell are you doing? We all need to be flying unicorns by 2035. You know, it's jetpacks and wingsuits for everybody, electric pogo sticks only, and, you know, elevator, escalator, sidewalks, whatever those things are, and no individual personal transportation besides that, maybe regular bicycles. Obviously, I'm on a tangent. All right, gasifier tech. Check it out. Links, as always, in the description. The video, though, to catch if you want to ditch right now and go watch it is called 100 Years of Wood-Powered Vehicles. Okay. Dab time. that was gasification that was the gasification of Steve <laughs> we'll talk more about gasification technology in an upcoming episode uh, as I said I think it's fantastic interesting stuff um, some of you may recall I have a number of like weird mini bike projects around here and somewhere in the back of my head is already knocking around the notion of the idea for a project um, and it may be a long time in coming to fruition I think it takes a while to figure out the ins and outs of how one goes about building their own little system. I think everyone is different, you know, it's kind of like the first time, um, every time for us hobbyist builders. So, um, I'll update you. I'll update you at some point in time on that when I've taken my first baby steps towards, uh, testing out gasification for myself. Uh, okay, so the the next and last thing I wanted to tell you about today um, is a. I just wanted to bring everybody's attention to a fantastic and interesting uh, YouTube channel. Uh, that's the American Mythology YouTube channel, and um, 
It's a channel I've been watching for, I don't know, a year or so now. Uh, I think the first story that attracted me to the channel and the one that I want to sort of introduce uh, for you folks is one that I ran across that I think will have some familiar um, vibes to a lot of folks uh, who... Uh, um, vibes to a lot of folks uh, who might listen to the podcast. Uh, at any rate, I'm going to pull up the channel here in front of me and tell you the title of the video is called They Lived in Hollow Trees. In parentheses, Appalachian Settlers and the American Sycamore. Um, go check that video out if you want. Real entertaining. You know, I want to say it's it's really short. It's like a 10 minute video. He does one follow up video on this on his channel and. If you look hard out there on YouTube, you can find a couple other interesting like tidbits that are unrelated, um, kind of also talk about, kind of also talk about people living in circumstances where they lived uh, amongst the branches of trees or in the case of this story, uh, in a hollow in the trunk in this in a hollow in the trunk in the center of a living tree these american sycamores are legendary trees most of them of course have been logged out of existence uh, perhaps all of the greatest examples of them uh, many decades ago in the name of i guess manifest destiny right Paving, paving the way all the way out here to Seattle for me so I could sit in my attic and, and talk about it a hundred and some odd years later. But uh, early settlers, uh, frontiersmen, uh, unhomed folks were known to shelter for short periods of time and seasonally and even in some cases for extended periods of time in trees. Uh, for some reason, this reminds me of uh, the Old Mother Hubbard uh, nursery rhyme. Wasn't it Old Mother Hubbard who lived in a shoe, had so many children, she didn't know what to do? Um, these These trees were gigantic. They were in excess of 15, 20 feet or more in diameter. And so with a circumference of what would seem like, you know, 100 feet around these things. Very tall, very uh, heavily leaved trees provide great shelter from above uh, in the immediate surroundings around the foot of these trees. And uh, people were known to live in them, as I said, and as this story will, will tell you. Um, he brings up a book that was written, uh, My Side of the Mountain, which I think a lot of people might gloss over the, uh, the fact that that tale was a novel. Uh, so it was a characterization of a uh, young boy living in the woods and in the mountains. I believe they made one or more movies about this in the late 60s, early 1970s um, in the tradition of your, you know, latter day Western heroes like Grizzly Adams, etc. Um, great channel. Uh, the biggest vibe really though wasn't Mother Old Mother Hubbard vibes. Uh, it reminded me very much of uh, a video that 
I hold near and dear to my heart just because it's so wonderful. And, uh, you know, I, I make no claims to believe a single um, bit about there are no trees on flat earth. But when I utter those words, those who know, know the legend that is and was the There Are No Trees on Flat Earth video series. Uh, great stuff, incredible theory, uh, very fun to ponder and turn over in your mind, very fun to look at trees, mountains, megalithic rock monuments in a new light, um, having been exposed to that theory and, and this little tidbit about people living in hollow trees in North America in the not too distant past in a non-trivial fashion almost like almost like they were like remembering a, a former way of life readapting you know back temporarily however temporarily uh, to a mode of survival that uh, to a mode of survival that they recognize instinctively as being you know totally doable so uh, again the channel America Again, the channel, American Mythology. The video that was really fun, that got me started, they lived in hollow trees. Appalachian Settlers and the American Sycamore. He's got dozens of videos. He's got like 40,000 subscribers. He's got really good um, really good production value and, and just great, like... You know, the Astonishing Story of the Goat Man. I don't know who the Goat Man is, but he did this video five years ago. I want to watch it. <laughs> A 200-year-old message hidden in the Ohio woods. Um, you know, Judgment Day arrived in the middle of his sermon. You know, These are a few titles of, of videos that he's done here. Did Robert Johnson sell his soul to play the blues? The thumbnail of a man standing at the crossroads. So, great channel. American Mythology, I doubt he'll ever hear about this um, little shout out but uh, love the channel love the topic check it out, let me know what you guys think I've got more, I've got stuff on deck really interesting stuff uh, I'm trying to say I'm back here now, back at the desk back recording and back editing and back publishing uh there's 122 other episodes of Baked and Awake out there for you to check out. They cover many, many amazing topics from the mud flood to the mystery of Bruce and Brandon Lee's deaths to the Maury Island incident out here in the Pacific Northwest, right off the uh, coast of where I live here in the Seattle area. With 122 other episodes, there's sure to be a story there that you'll enjoy. Please, if you made it this far, know that I appreciate you deeply. I'm going to wrap this up, chop it up, and get it out to everybody. And look forward to doing another one again real soon. Between now and then, be good to each other. Please share the podcast and share the YouTube channel with friends. I have video content planned for 2023 as well. Follow-up visits to architecture here in my local area as well as some uh, video content for new topics things that we haven't discussed before look forward to it YouTube as always is the best place to leave your comments I see them there and can reply to them there you can also as ever email me at talk to us at bakedandawake.com recently put a little bit of work into the website uh, look forward to uh, visiting that and uh, you know let me know you listen to this podcast by visiting the website because I'm checking my website's numbers quite a bit right now a lot to come so um, I'll leave it at that <laughs> that's why I left all this to the end of the podcast for you if anybody made it this far you're here for me and and 
you know, you're here for this nonsense. Uh, it's tough out here figuring out what you're what you're doing creatively sometimes. I know I lament that probably uh, more than I need to, and I need to just remember to talk and tell stories and enjoy myself, and, you know, you guys have been here the whole time for that from day one, so I don't know why I need to overthink it. So again, hopefully something there for you in the archive, maybe something you haven't listened to. Again, the channel, American Mythology. The video that was really fun, that got me started, they lived in hollow trees. Appalachian settlers and the American sycamore. He's got dozens of videos. He's got like 40,000 subscribers. He's got really good um, really good production value and, and just great, like... You know, the astonishing story of the goat man. I don't know who the goat man is, but he did this video five years ago. I want to watch it. <laughs> A 200 year old message hidden in the Ohio woods. Um, you know, Judgment Day arrived in the middle of his sermon. You know, these are a few titles of, of the videos that he's done here. Did Robert Johnson sell his soul to play the blues? The thumbnail of a man standing at the crossroads. So great channel. American mythology. I doubt he'll ever hear about this um, little shout out, but uh, love the channel, love the topic. Check it out. Let me know what you guys think. I've got more. I've got stuff on deck, really interesting stuff. Uh, I'm trying to say I'm back here now, back at the desk, back recording and back editing and back publishing. Uh, there's 122 other episodes of Baked and Awake out there for you to check out. They cover many, many amazing topics from the mud flood to the mystery of Bruce and Brandon Lee's deaths to the Maury Island incident out here in the Pacific Northwest, right off the uh, coast of where I live here in the Seattle area. With 122 other episodes, there's sure to be a story there that you'll enjoy. Please, if you made it this far, know that I appreciate you deeply. I'm going to wrap this up, chop it up, and get it out to everybody. And look forward to doing another one again real soon. Between now and then, be good to each other. Please share the podcast and share the YouTube channel with friends. I have video content planned for 2023 as well. Follow-up visits to architecture here in my local area as well as some uh, video content for new topics, things that we haven't discussed before. Look forward to it. YouTube, as always, is the best place to leave your comments. I see them there and can reply to them there. You can also, as ever, email me at talk to us at bakedandawake.com. Recently put a little bit of work into the website. Uh, look forward to uh, visiting that and, uh, you know, let me know you listen to this podcast by visiting the website because I'm checking my website's numbers quite a bit right now. A lot to come. So, um, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> That's why I left all this to the end of the podcast for you. If anybody made it this far, you're here for me and, and, you know, you're here for this nonsense. Uh, it's tough out here figuring out what you're, what you're doing creatively sometimes. I know I lament that probably uh, more than I need to, and I need to just 
remember to talk and tell stories and enjoy myself and you know you guys have been here the whole time for that from day one so I don't know why I need to overthink it so again hopefully something there for you in the archive maybe something you haven't listened to yet I'm definitely looking back at early episodes and as I listen to them I'm wanting in you know the strongest terms to either pull some of these episodes down or potentially remaster and re-record them for better sound mixing. So definitely open to suggestions on what episodes would be most appreciated to be revisited. I'm thinking about the Norb theory. I'm thinking about Mel's Hole. I'm thinking about potentially Maury Island, which I just mentioned a little while ago to start those are near the top of my list but i can think of many others uh, i have one on mud flood research and grand tartaria that you know i had a long preamble to a lot of sessioning and and poking about before we got into the meat of the episode uh and bad sound mixing on top of it so you know looking to put together that top 10 list of topics to revisit here, you know, going into year four, year, I don't even know, 27. Yeah, year five or so of the podcast. And one last statement, the Patreon is dead. I've gone ahead and shut it down. I believe I've got it shut down. The 12 or so patrons that I have, uh, if any of you are listening, I deeply appreciate every one of you and the uh, length and extent uh, and loyalty of all of your support. Uh, I never felt it was that powerful of a, you know, compelling value proposition. Like, why put content behind a weird Patreon paywall just for some people who paid extra money? Like, you don't have enough subscriptions in your life. So, it's shut down. Thank you, thank you, thank you to everybody who uh, contributed to the Patreon. It was never a really huge part of, you know, financing, uh, you know, some world takeover of Baked and Awake. And that was, you know, kind of by design because I just couldn't stand to even dream of charging people very much money for what we're doing at, at that level and, and in some exclusive way, again, because the Patreon supporters are supposed to get stuff. And I don't know if anybody ever even got a single sticker or t-shirt that was supposed to go to them from Patreon because they have a little bit of an automated rewards system for people who have supported a certain amount of time I just it was it just felt icky so Patreon's dead there's a PayPal button on my website always and always has been bakedinawake.com if you ever would like to make a one time donation to support the podcast maybe I talk about a research project maybe I talk about a piece of equipment or Uh, some sort of goal or plan for the podcast and you hear it and you take it as a opportunity to throw down Um, that's a really great way to do it I think for now right Um, that's a really great way to do it I think for now right it seems low overhead to me and you know it's it's no pressure that's that that's the episode we're gonna do more soon And that's more than enough of that fapping about at the end. Uh, I'll probably even trim quite a bit of this. If I'm, you know, if God is merciful, I will. (laughs) To all of us. All right, you guys. You guys are the best. I love you. You know what to do. Smoke that indica. Do shit anyway. Until next time. I've been Steve. In conclusion. The Enrichment Center is required to remind you that you will be baked, and then there will be cake. It is worth mentioning that there has been a recent resurgence of interest in wood gasification technology, as it has the potential to provide a way to produce renewable energy from sustainable resources such as wood waste and other types of biomass. Hemp, perhaps? Additionally, The development of more efficient gasifiers and the integration of new technologies such as catalysts and adsorbents have improved the syngas quality and the conversion efficiency of the process. WGVs are still not widely used and considered to be less efficient and environmentally friendly compared to vehicles that run on fossil fuels. 
but they have the potential to provide a sustainable solution in areas with limited access to conventional fuels and with specific conditions like war or natural disasters.